And uh, if you registered today um, to attend, you will receive the recording and the slides in your email. Otherwise, you can find uh, a recording of today's presentation with slides on the Will's World site or Will's site, along with other information about upcoming Will's World shorts. I will be keeping an eye on the chat box. So if you do have any audio issues that I can help with, go ahead and um, just send me a message and we'll try to get those resolved. So on with the show. Uh, I'm excited today to welcome today's speakers, to thank them both for their time and their energy ad advocating for our state's libraries. Uh, first off, we have, my slide advancing isn't working. There we go. First off, we have Connie Meyer. She's the director of Bridges Library System and the co-chair of the LDNL, Library Development and Legislation Committee. And Scott Vries is library director at UW Scout and our WLA president. So with that, I'm gonna get out of the way and let these two share their uh, wisdom. I'm gonna hand over presenter to Connie and we will get moving. Good morning, everyone. Hang on one moment. Thank you. So thank you very much for the intro, Andy. Um, welcome, everyone. I, I like to think about starting um, a presentation with the topic by thinking about the word, the topic that you're discussing. So I looked up advocacy, and this is the Merriam-Webster definition of advocacy, which is the act or process of supporting a cause or proposal. Um, we do that all the time when, um, in our daily life, when we're um, in our own personal relationships. My daughter is a is a really good example of an expert on her own advocacy. She's she's always acting um, or are advocating for her own rights. So you we do this all the time in our personal life, but we also do it in our work life. And why do we do it? Well, we advocate for our libraries because it's important. And unless someone like you cares a whole awful lot, nothing is going to get better. It's not, said the great Dr. Seuss in the Lorax. And and I and I really believe that. And um and I think that what we do matters, libraries matter. And so we, we speak um, on behalf of an important uh, organization. So oftentimes there is a discussion about the difference between advocacy and lobbying because there are some very strict rules in the state of Wisconsin. And I'm going to click on some of these links in the presentation. So bear with me while I click on that so that you can see. Um, Wisconsin Ethics Com Commission actually outlines um, the rules and the requirements for lobbying in Wisconsin. And there, there's a very, there are very specific regulations um, and they have to be followed. So you never want to get yourself in trouble by by not understanding that those exist and certain things are allowed and certain things aren't allowed. Um, but that at the end of the day, most of what we do is not lobbying. Most of what we do is advocacy. Um, we don't spend a huge amount of our time on any given day lobbying um, by the definition. So for the most part, what we're talking about here and what we do in our work world is uh, advocacy. Um, yep, and I would just add, Connie, that, that it's an important distinction, and it, it does, because many of us are public employees in various roles, that there is that concern about the ethical aspects of, of what we're doing. And so to be aware of those um, those uh, strictures is really important. So I would invite everybody to talk about that with your funding agencies and those you report to um, uh, as as part of what you're doing so that so that everything's visible for what you're doing. Right, and you know, in terms of if if you're in a public library, um, you know, you have a, a municipal attorney. Um, if you're in a county, you might have corporation counsel. So don't be has don't hesitate to ask them if you're in doubt about anything, like sending out a flyer or um, something, just to make sure that you're not crossing any lines. So if in doubt, check. Um, but and there's the link to that website very helpful so that you can understand a little bit more about it but um, advocating for your position um, is typically not lobbying 
um, but pay attention to the rules. So public policy, that's what we're trying to impact when we, when we talk about libraries, um, because laws are written that impact us every day, and um, there are funding priorities that the government has, and, led, and the state legislature has many, many, many priorities um, for the limited and scarce resources they have, so we, we need to understand how we fit into that, um, what we're trying to impact, um, and we need to speak sort of a united voice. So talk more about that in a little while, but um, if we are indeed going to have a positive impact on public policy, we need to pay attention to those funding priorities and the, and, the, and the ways that we can actually make positive change. The policymaker is the person that we're trying to influence in terms of public policy, and that's generally a legislator. Uh, in addition to legislators, of course, there are um, their aides, really, really important because many times they are the ones that are uh, informing the public policymaker. Um, they dig into the issues, they understand them completely. So oftentimes, uh, the don't forget about those legislative aides. They're very important. And then other other lobbying agencies and organizations that you may have similar um, shared shared visions with similar purposes. Um, so effective advocacy really includes a number of components. They're in red here, and we'll talk about each one of these individually throughout the slideshow. So there's, there's a, a, being an effective leader, there's building relationships, there's mapping your influence, then there's public speaking and writing, and media relationships. So these all come into play to be an effective um, advocate. So leadership, what, is that, what does that mean? That oh, all of us are leaders in our organizations in our own way. Um, we think about what the library does, the importance of it, what our vision is. We think we should be thinking about what the strategy is to get to that future state, to that where you want to be. Um, and then we think about how to effectively communicate the importance of that. Um, when you're having a conversation with someone on an individual level or when you're talking with a legislator, uh, part of that, part of what you need to do is listen. Um, listen to them, ask questions so that you can understand and then read the reactions that you get from them so that as you're having the conversation, it isn't just you reading from a cue card. You're you're adapting based on the reaction that you're getting from the person, um, and then um, to know and understand as a leader that you have to be resilient because you won't always get what you want. Um, maybe you won't get any of what you want, but you are committed to staying in this game and being there to fight another day. That might mean you have to back up, re-strategize, think about a different way to approach it. Um, that's all okay, but you're in it for the long the long game, and that means that you will be there again. You're going to stick around. You're going to fight the, for an, another day. Um, you may win. You may lose the battle, but you never want to lose the war. And I think um, I think it's also important. And, and Connie used the phrase "long game," and I had that same phrase in my in my notes. Um, and sometimes that confidence that you are in it for the long haul can mean that if you if something seems like an initial setback, it allows you to realize that it, that that there are other opportunities to follow up with with uh, funding um, funding initiatives and some of the advocacy work that you're doing. So always think of that long game. Think about where you're trying to get to. And if one strategy doesn't work, there's always some other strategies that might get you there. Um, this next slide um, is, is a piece that um, I wanted us to reflect a little bit about leadership. Um, it, and any of those of you who have done any leadership training um, of any kind, realize that that there are a whole different varieties of style of leaders, um, and each one of you has your own style. So it's not that everyone will become the same type of leader, and I think we have a stereotype about what leadership means. 
um, embrace your own style. Are you the type of leader that thrives with one-on-one -on -one or small group interactions? So you might be one that can be a behind-the-scenes coalition builder. That's still leadership. Um, some are more a little more extroverted. They love working a room. They the the idea of cocktail party doesn't uh, send them fleeing for the exits. Um, there are those who are in that space. Um, others enjoy a planned public presentation and are and really excel at that piece of it. So every one of us has our strengths with that. So think about your own strengths for lead for how the type of leader you are and build out from that. Um, the next piece of this is what I would describe as the introversion extroversion trap, and it's a story we tend to tell ourselves in the library world that we're introverts. So this idea of being an advocate or a lobbyist. Um, and we bristle at it a bit because we're not that type of person. I think it's a mistake to think of extroverts are the ones that can be ad advocates because I think there is power in those who can do that quiet discussion and that reflective discussion with individuals and so and build out from that. So go with your strengths, go with what you do well and build out from that. And I'll have to admit several years ago I, I bristled at the idea of calling myself a leader um, but learned that my skills and my leadership style actually um, could be of tremendous benefit in understanding and being empathetic um, toward those I was approaching. So that's so don't don't think of this as a binary kind of thing where you're either introverted or extroverted. Uh, in the library world, we're often situationally introverts, uh, or it's situationally extroverts, rather. We we get in those situations where it's our show, and we are very comfortable about talking about that. So use those opportunities. Next is know thyself, which is what what is your brand? What is you as a library? What is what what is what you do? What are the services good for? My own way of approaching this is I I divide it up into three elements. Um, one is that we have we we share spaces um, in public libraries. It is a community gathering place. It's a collaborative space. That's part of the brand. The second piece is shared resources, and and in in public libraries, that tends that tends more in the direction of books, um, but it also includes um, electronic resources, it includes eBooks, it includes streaming video, and in the academic world, streaming video is a powerful tool. And one of the ways of selling the your brand is to say that the library is a way of people pooling together their resources and getting access to these resources that they wouldn't be able to afford individually. And that seems to be a message that resonates well with those who are not within the library community. It's a very efficient way of, of people sharing resources. Um, the third element is shared expertise. Um, librarians are, are an invaluable piece in teaching people how to navigate uh, the information landscape. Um, and that's what we're selling. It's not that we we hold the information and they have to come to us for it. We live in a time of information um, excess rather than scarcity. But part of what we bring to the table is helping people see what good information looks like and what bad information looks like. So in thinking about this, think about what you offer your community, your institution, your campus, or your city. What value to your do you bring to them? And so when you're doing advocacy, think about if you're in front of a city council or village board, if you're in front of a county board, if you're in front of a campus group or an administrator on a, on a university or technical college campuses, what value does your group bring to, to what they're trying to do? All right, so um, we move on then to the next important, probably in my opinion, the most important part of advocacy, which is relationships. They really are the foundation. Um, it all stems from there. Uh, at the Wisconsin Library Association LDNL table, um, and we're the group that that deals with legislation, and we um, so we talk a lot about the importance of building relationships um, because we are always thinking about how that will benefit us no matter what 
uh, whether the legislative seat changes. Um, in, in the state capitol, you'll find that people, especially aides, will move from office to office. So if you have developed a relationship with an aide, um, that'll hold you in good stead no matter where they go, and they may well go to a different office. Um, legislators, they be, start out as assembly people, and then they become senators. So you'll, you'll see that uh, those relationships, the positions, uh, may change, but those relationships will hold you in good stead, and you're you're expanding your sphere of influence as you develop those relationships. Um, there is an excellent handout. I'm going to click on this link here, um, and pardon me while I while it opens up a PDF here that I want to share with you. And to say it more, Associates um, has developed this wonderful document here about building relationships where they talk about the four I's, initiate, inquire, invest, and influence. They go into a good deal of detail about what, what that means and, and how, how are you to be an active listener. Of course, you don't interrupt with your own stories. You wait and you listen. Um, don't, and don't just listen pretending to listen, but waiting for the first moment where you can pop in with your own story because the person that you're communicating with who's talking to you can see that in your eyes and in your face. If you're merely just waiting for a spot to jump in there, that's not active listening and they can pick up on that. So really practice that. Practice stopping, listening, connecting with body language, with your eyes, listening to them and taking that in and that's sort of that building that empathy with that person. Um, that's really, really important. Um, invest in that relationship. You know, we talk about uh, at uh, LDNL about the importance of uh, sending thank yous. Um, sending a thank you after you have a chance to talk with them or meet with them. Um, inviting them into your library to do a town hall at your library. You're, you're investing, you're checking in. If they're in the newspaper, um, because some uh, there's a story about something that they did, some legislation that they sponsored, or just some event that they were at. You can connect with them and uh, send them a scan of the of the newspaper article and say, "Saw this and keep up the great work." Though that's a way to invest in. It doesn't take uh, it doesn't take money. It just takes investing in that relationship. Um, you can uh, think about the influence that you have and know that it's not it's not a solo activity. Um, you do that by building those relationships with people who have those things in common. Um, this document, um, I do have it linked in the slideshow and I want to thank Kathy Pletcher for sharing it with us. She, she is a consultant with Morris Associates and she um, really, uh, I would like to also thank her publicly for the, she created the basics of this slide show. She's the co-chair of LDNL and I, and I want to thank her for all her hard work. Um, and all of her expertise, which she shares with us um, regularly. So that is the, the, the four eyes of relationship building. So what more details about it, face-to-face uh, -face is always best, of course. Um, you can have the deepest connection in a relationship when you are face-to-face. -face. It's not always possible, but it is always best. Um, especially now in our digital world, there's so many ways to communicate with people um, and we should take advantage of them. But the more we take advantage of them, the more special those other kinds of uh, relationship building things are. So, for example, if you want to thank someone for meeting with you, you can send them an email of thanks. That's great. Um, you can send them a handwritten note. That's even better. Um, you can meet with them for coffee to thank them. That's best because that's face-to-face. -face. Of course, that's hard with people's busy schedules. So this is the ideal, not necessarily something that you can achieve all the time. Um, practice empathy. How can you help them? It's not all about you. That's that, that's that, it's an important part of a relationship is just uh, trying to understand where they're coming from. Um, yep, and, and knowing add, that, yep. 
And Connie, I'll just add, add here with the how can you help them. Um, the idea isn't to come to them and only have conversations with them when you need something. Uh, <laughs> advocacy, is, as Connie said, is all about that building up of a relationship. And part of that involves well, actually being curious about the work that they're doing with their organization or within their um, scope of, of responsibility. And how can the library and how can your staff or how can you personally be of assistance with helping them be more successful with what they're doing. And my perspective on that is the third bullet point says, and I have a colleague who used this um, metaphor, it's, it's making a deposit in a goodwill account, and which sounds a little transactional, but quite honestly, you, every time you have an interaction with somebody, I feel like it does deposit that sense of goodwill in this account. And you don't have to say, what did I get out of it every single time? Um, it doesn't have to be transactional every single time, but at some point, you're going to develop you're going to build up that sense of goodwill that investment um, that has happened within goodwill and at some point it's going to pay some dividends for you when you come to the table and that person will know that you are a good partner and a good collaboration um, um, person in in what they're trying to do and they will back what you are doing because you've built up that that trustful relationship so as Scott said be curious, um, that's that part of uh, that relationship where you're curious about uh, what it is they're doing, their life. Um, if you go to uh, meet in them in their office, you can just be curious, what does what that poster on the wall mean? Well, you know, they, they might be very proud of that. What is, what, uh, they have their pictures of their family, ask questions, be curious. Um, not to be disingenuous, but to, to be real. Um, and model that trust, which is just really, really important. The trust is the foundation of all relationships. So you always want to be completely honest and very trustworthy. And um, if you don't know the answer to something, if they ask you a question, don't make up something. Say, I don't know, but I will find out for you. Um, be inclusive. Um, and um, don't let conflicts fester um, if there's something that is that you're unhappy with um, or you think they may be, may be unhappy with, just don't, don't let it, don't stew about it, have that conversation, just be very honest um, and um, tackle it, have that difficult conversation. But before you do practice, because you don't want to say something that will damage the relationship, of course. It's like a relationship um, in, in many ways. It's no different than any relationship that you might have. And one of my ground rules that I've learned over the years is never assume bad intentions. Um, I think that if you remember that about the other person, never assume bad intentions. Um, it goes a long way to coming to a place of understanding. Um, so that's the, I think that's an important thing to remember. Um, they, the a legislator that you're talking with cares deeply. They wouldn't have run for that position if they didn't care deeply about serving and about their community. So, to, so be mindful of that. Um, and they may have a different view than you do on a particular issue, but they care too. So, um, Never assume bad intentions. And always be thankful. Uh, thank, thankful for their time, thankful for their service. Uh, it, if you are truly thankful, it, that, that's a genuine uh, relationship building um, piece. So who needs to be on our list? Who are we trying to talk with to influence? Well, of course, the powers that be. They're the elected officials, the appointed administrators. Um, there are a lot of them in our world. Uh, there are, because we work within the government, there are a lot of people who are stakeholders. They have a vested interest in what we're doing. So uh, they're, they're on our list. We need to be always building relationships. So it isn't necessarily just that state legislator. It's also the elected official at the local level. In some ways, that's more important than the state legislator, depending on the you know your library situation, but our elected officials, who support our library by um, allocating or appropriating funding for our libraries, whether that's in a public situation or, or not. Uh, they are very, very important, though they are the powers that be. Um, the appointed administrators are um, not elected, but they are oftentimes incredibly powerful, so just always remember that. Um, community leaders, 
uh, throughout uh, all of the communities in Wisconsin, you will be able to point to certain people who are those leaders, um, whether it's uh, the leader of a company or a nonprofit in your community. Um, if there's a leadership program within your leader in within your community, it's something to investigate or participate in because you will broaden your sphere of influence. You will make connections with other leaders. Um, I highly recommend developing those relationships. Um, school superintendent and board members, of course, they are the, the the people that you work with most closely to move the library's agenda forward. Friends groups. Um, friends groups are, are key. Some, some public libraries don't have friends groups. Some do. You know, there's lots of stories about friends groups that aren't so friendly. Um, but at the end of the day, um, it's, it behooves you to develop a friends group and uh, make sure that uh, they that you're working together um, and, and united in a common purpose. If there are citizens who love the library enough to join your friends group, you want to you wanna tap into that and take advantage of that. And then there's just the citizen advocates who are library lovers. Um, and they are really, really important. Um, if you can run, keep a running list of people that you know who are uh, great library supporters, they love the library, they may use the library or not, um, but I have, all, during my time as a library director, I always had a running list of great citizen advocates so that I could call upon them if I had a board opening or if I needed somebody to speak at the city council level or just a behind the scenes conversation. Citizens are, have a powerful voice with elected officials. And then, and you know, there may be other people that I'm forgetting, um, but <clears throat> think of, really every interaction that you have is in some ways advocacy for the library. You never know somebody that you're interacting with, um, especially if you're in a, a library and you're just providing library service out on the floor. And uh, I had that happen a new, number of times during uh, the time that I was at a, at a library where you know, we'd, I'd be helping someone make copies and then two years later they would send a note with a check. Uh, thank you for providing such excellent service I really didn't know how to use that copy or, or whatever so so be mindful of that um, providing that excellent service does help build that potential for people that can expand your sphere of influence yeah but I'll add a little bit to that um, this this list here is a little more focus on the academic library world but in general um, I think we should be mindful of the fact that it is not just library directors um, that are leaders with, it's not necessarily something that is in everybody's position description, um, but every one of your staff people is in some sense an advocate for your library. And, and so it's good for everyone to be mindful of those things, because as Connie said, every interaction you have with, with a, a member of the public or a user of your library or a student or a faculty member is an opportunity for advocacy, for demonstrating your value. Um, another thing I would add is um, I have, uh, I've had experience in both public and academic libraries. Um, and in the, my public library career, I, I spent about eight years working for the St. Paul Public Library System. And they are uh, nationally known for the power uh, and uh, the efficacy of their Friends of the Library group. Um, and, and actually, we had a city council member that, that told us at one point that the city council member feared two groups that came um, in front of them and, and asked for money. Um, one was the Friends of the Library, and the other one was the Little Sisters of the Poor. So um, that speaks <laughs> to some of the moral authority that we do carry um, as libraries and, and also speaks to the powerful um, the powerful element of friends of the library and citizen advocates because they had powerful friends who had influence and were and they were willing to to put up some dollars um, to match some of the city funds so that can be very a very powerful tool um, so here who's on the list for uh, kind of the academic library um, advocacy audience um, elected officials in the Wisconsin legislature um, and that's and that's it's an interesting thing because most of our representatives in the Wisconsin Assembly or, or the Senate um, often make public appearances in our communities and um, and 
and often there are opportunities to get to know them. And initially you might feel a little bit of an intimidation factor in that, like who am I to walk up to my local representative? But quite honestly, my experience has been that they are hungry to hear your input. They want to know what people in their communities think. And public libraries are especially, are uniquely positioned to understand what their local communities think. Um, and so they are hungry, hungry to hear what you have to say and, and want to hear about um, the services that you provide. And I can tell you that um, it's really an interesting thing. Um, uh, the assembly person who represents the city of Menominee, and it actually is a is a district that wraps into New Richmond. Um, he was somebody I was able to meet with in person last year at Library Legislative Day. Um, and during our conversation, he asked uh, if if it would be okay if he paid us a visit um, here at the Stout Library. And uh, you know that I'm like, is this really happening? Kind of thing. <laughs> and he was happy to arrive. We had a great conversation both in person on Legislative Day, and then he came and we talked about what the library was doing and some of the innovative approaches that we were that we were pursuing. It gave me a chance not only to sell the Stout Library, but also the, the UW system um, and, and what we're doing to educate students and to put people to work later on. And about half the time was time spent, and Rob Staffschult is the assembly person's name, was spent talking about hunting and fishing. And I have a staff person that lived in Alaska for a while, and, and Rob spent um, a good 10 minutes talking about fishing and, and hunting bears in Alaska. And that's gold for advocacy, because now Rob thinks we're the greatest thing since sliced bread, and when he sees us coming and asking for some, a little assistance, we develop that relationship. And, and not that he'll just magically fund everything we've ever dreamed of, but we've developed that relationship so we have that trust level. Scott, let me just jump in there if you don't mind. Um, yep. I, uh, this is a perfect place to insert that uh, the Wisconsin Library Association lobbyist, Steve Conway, uh, often talks about uh, the importance of inviting l legislators back in their districts into your libraries because they do like to meet with their constituents out in the district and he, Steve calls it, invite them into your house, he says. Invite them into your house. You have this beautiful facility, or maybe it's not so beautiful. It doesn't matter if it's not beautiful, they'll see how much need you have. So um, invite them into your house. Uh, last uh, week or so, we uh, had a meeting with several of the uh, legislators on Joint Finance Committee, um, and one of them, we were talking about having visits in local libraries, and one of the legislators said, well, I used to love being meeting with my constituents in the library, but every time I call now, they're too busy. They can't they can't slot me in. They don't have any they don't have enough meeting rooms. <laughs> so, um, you know, engage with them. And if you have really busy busy meeting rooms and there's no space for your legislator, maybe you can work up some uh, special. Uh, spot for them. Um, but it isn't a bad thing for them necessarily to know that you're so busy that you're being used to that much that they, they can't even find a spot. But um, invite them. Um, I guess I think that's the message so that they know that they can feel welcome to come to the library. Yep, that's an important piece to remember. Um, so um, on on campus, for those of you who are representing um, um, either technical colleges or or UW system or private colleges um, and your libraries, um, campus administrators are important people to get to know, and and actually they want to know how what's going on within the institution. So they are genuinely curious, and that's been my experience. And, and I've been fortunate here at Stout because the person who was the chancellor was actually president at the technical college where I also worked for four years. And so we have an opportunity to just have informal conversations about our experience in the, in the contrasts and, compare, and, and similarities between the two institutions. And so we have history together, and, and that's a tremendous advantage, I think, um, in, in getting some of what we want. The other several bullet points in our, uh, here, especially um, academic departments and instructional designers and instructional de technologists in our IT group, as well as academic support services like tutoring services, these are your natural partners on campus. And as much as you can do to collaborate with them, 
and and to consider shared services or even sharing space is invaluable in demonstrating to the campus as a whole and demonstrating to administration that you get it, you understand what your role is, you're part of the teaching and learning process, you're part of the research process, so that's really important. Uh, then the next bullet point down here is uh, foundations associated with your institutions. Many, most of your institutions of higher learning do have uh, their own foundations that are affiliated with and uh, connected with the um, with the parent uh, with the campus. Um, they have money, um, and and so they are good people to get to know, so that you're on the radar because occasionally they will have. Um, people that come to them that want to make a donation, and if you're in part of that conversation, they will think of you. You don't have to be there in the room when that donor comes, uh, but but the foundation will think of your needs and the opportunities that might happen there. Um, also, uh, both with uh, academic institutions as well as um, public libraries, uh, community foundations are are really an interesting. Um, uh, cauldron for connecting people together. Many of your leaders in your community, some of whom have a little bit of money, are connected with the with the local community foundations, and that's really can be a, a great opportunity uh, to make those connections. Especially if you have building projects um, that you're that you're working on, having the support of your local community foundation board and those who participate in the community foundation is gold and, and pretty much essential to getting those projects um, um, funded and completed. Um, the next item is a business community and I listed alumni in this as well. Academic institutions have relationships with their local businesses and, and also relationships with alumni, many of whom can potentially be donors later on. And one of the things that actually that our archivist here at UW Stout does really well is when alumni come to visit and have conversations with the chancellor about possible donations, she will prepare, prepare a, um, a uh, let's call it a dossier uh, on them and look back at when they were here at Stout and develop a portfolio of pictures and descriptions so that they're taking back to their time that they were at Stout and so they feel that connection and, and it also allows them to feel like, yep, we remember that you were here and we're honoring that time that you were here and it makes them feel more connected to the institution. That's all part of advocacy and ways of, of making feel part people a part of your organizations. The last one on here is students. Um, students are our primary audience at the library, and most campuses either have a student senate um, or they have student clubs who can be a resource for funds, and especially in many of the UW campuses, student senate can vote a substantial amount of money for funding. Um, a lot of your initiative is especially a number of technology initiatives. So that is a huge group to make sure that you're interacting with and developing a relationship with. So how can all these uh, stakeholders help us? Um, well, of course, as Scott talked about, they can give us money. Um, they can donate to our organization. They can exercise influence on our behalf by um, uh, if they know someone who um, they can say, put in a good word about the library, um, that's really important. Um, they can support our strategies, uh, advocate at large. They can provide people power, materials, expertise. They can expand our connections and, and our sphere of influence. They can, collab they can collaborate. Um, uh, this one's yours, Scott, I think, as yep. advocacy. Yep, um, and this is sort of the phrase that I keeps popping in my head of, of some of the collaboration that we do do with, with partners on uh, within the campus here, and, and, and I have the phrase deep collaboration, even co-locating in here. Many, um, both public libraries and academic libraries, do partner with others so that there are uh, multiple services within a single building, um, and some really exciting things have happened with public libraries and retail environments. Um, that, may, that provides a built-in connection with a lot of people in your community to create those sorts of things. It, uh, 
it develops widespread community buy-in. Um, and even sometimes when those, those efforts to create something like that don't work, you've developed ongoing relationships with individuals in the community that will pay dividends later on. Um, an academic institution is one of the things that uh, a number of people have done is create environments that are learning commons environments, which include not only library services, but also technology support, tutoring services, um, and a whole variety of things. Usually there is some opportunities for a cafe environment in that. All that can be considered part of advocacy because it improves your status within, within your institutions and demonstrates that you're an integral part of the teaching and learning process. And I, and I would add, too, it, it works the same way in the public library world. The, um, many of the elected officials that, uh, we, that we hope to influence, uh, collaboration is just a key thing on their mind because they're thinking about it at the, at the level that they're at for their own organization, whether it's the city council, uh, the, the county board, the state legislator, they're thinking about partnerships, collaborations. Sometimes they're just thinking about it in terms of saving dollars, but, but usually they're thinking about it from a very big picture perspective because people that have a common mission or they have a thread of commonality between them are stronger together. Uh, they really are. You can learn so much from each other. So like, let, let's take, for example, um, memory, memory cafes that are, are often in uh, public libraries now. When, when you have the library working with the Alzheimer's Association, uh, everybody benefits from that because there's expertise in the Alzheimer's Association that we don't necessarily have in the library. But the library brings its own um, expertise so that the uh, Alzheimer's Association can expand their reach into the communities because the libraries are um, key to the community as a um, as a service and as a facility. So mapping the influence is you know that that influence piece um, thinking about those stakeholders who are they who cares about this and why really thinking about that um, that we have a lot of stakeholders so if you sit down and you think about all of them, you can list them all out, you'll forget some, but really thinking about that helps you realize how much potential there is. Um, uh, knowing who can help us. And then here's where I'm going to put in the pitch for the Wisconsin Library Association, and I've not been paid to say this, um, <laughs> but I will say that um, it's, it's important to think about the association. I'm clicking on the link here so that you can see the Wisconsin Library Association web website. It's wisconsinlibraries.org. Um, I hope you'll go there and think about joining if you're not already a member um, because we are stronger together and we, uh, we definitely can expand our sphere of influence um, more quickly when we work together. Um, and uh, the Wisconsin Library Association is doing great things for advocacy. And so I highly recommend that you join. And I also recommend that you encourage others to join. So whether you encourage people on your own staff, if you have the um, ability to do that, wh whether you encourage your, some of your friends of the library who um, seem to be more engaged, um, encourage them. If you can encourage them with um, making the financial commitment to pay their membership, that's, that's even better. Um, but I would really encourage you to think about because our success is closely tied with the success of the Wisconsin Library Association. Um, they help us not only with our continuing education opportunities, but with our with our advocacy. So um, that's the pitch that I have for you today: is think about being a member of Wisconsin Library Association. But also, as you're thinking about your influence, you need to think about. Okay, so not everybody is going to be on the same page with you. Some people might oppose you very um, out in the open. Some people might oppose you just because they realize the pie is the pie, and if your slice gets bigger, their slice gets smaller. So you need to be mindful of that and think about um, who are your allies who might oppose you. If someone opposes you, why is it? Um, because it might be something, some misunderstanding, something that you could address and, and uh, convert them so they're not opposing you. Um, and I'll it, just add, add I'll, I'll build on that and say that an important thing for when you're going to be presenting something in, in, in front of a group of people or proposing something, it's always good to anticipate concerns or opposition in advance so that you're prepared for that and maybe even 
I, I always think it's a good practice to name some of the reasons why someone might be opposed and then answer those in the course of what you're presenting because then you, then there's that awareness that you are actually in conversation with those that might be opposing you and that can win a lot of friends um, in the process. <laughs> So don't bury your head in the sand. Um, really, really flesh that out and know uh, what the opposition might be so that you're prepared. If, if all else fails, you have a comeback ready for um, if, if someone says something to oppose what it is you're presenting. Um, think about what resources and relationships you have. You know, we all have a certain amount of political capital. Um, and think about how, how you have that, how you can have more, how you spend it. Be careful how you spend it. Um, it's really important to think about those things as you're thinking about trying to expand your influence. Um, what is it that we're lacking? Um, what is it that we need? How do we get it so that we can think about being very strategic um, about how we position our message? Um, you might position your message different depending on uh, who you're talking with, what it is you're seeking, what it is you need. So we're talking about message here. What is your message? Keep it short and simple. Steve Conway, our lobbyist, has really grilled that into all the people on the legislative committee. Um, he'll say, you know, work up the work up the message, and he'll say, I want I want three bullet points, one page, uh, and that's always a challenge for librarians. I mean, it just is <laughs> uh, because you know we're 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 research based. We we what we have documentation. We have evidence. Uh, uh, why say in, in, in 10 words something you can say in 200, right? Um, <laughs> but uh, his message is, okay, whatever you have on there, pare that down. Uh, look at every single word and make sure that it's essential. Uh, don't get lost in the weeds. Do not go into the weeds. Um, you might have to go in the weeds in the conversation, so you need to know the weeds. Uh, but don't start there. Try to stay away from the weeds. Try not to get pulled into the weeds. Um, keep it short and simple as much as you possibly can. Five to ten words. The elevator message. So repeat your message. The rule of three is say three things. It's location, location, location. It's um, the three pigs. The, there's three, if you look through history, and I have a little link here that I'll just click on. You can read more about it. I think it's an interesting concept. The rule of three, three words, it cements things. Friends, Romans, countrymen, blood, sweat, and tears. There's, there's three words. Um, it, it makes a compelling message. Um, key points to support the message. Uh, evidence. Uh, why should they care? Think about it as you as you look through your written document. Look, think about it as if you're that person. Why why would I care about this? Um, what kind of outcomes are going to be achieved by that? What's the benefit for them? Uh, I'm going to go quickly. I see we're getting a little short on time here. So public speaking essentials part of what you do as an advocate for the library is speak to organizations. Um, and if you do, know your audience, know your purpose. Think about that carefully before you walk into that room. Tailor your message to who you're speaking uh, with and practice, practice, practice. Um, remember uh, that practice is, is key. And I'll just I'll just add to this um, and remember that you know more about the topic that you're talking about than your audience does or the individual you're talking to and be confident in that knowledge. I think it's very important that we that we own our expertise because I think that feel makes us feel more powerful and much more likely to be strong advocates. Um, next is read your audience, be prepared to improvise. If, if you are losing your audience, if you can see through eye contact or body language or any of that type of thing, be prepared to abandon pieces of it or go in a different direction. So one has to understand one's topic well enough so that you're not so stuck into what you were going to say that you see you're losing people that you can't um, uh, repurpose what you're doing. Right, right, right. So, so yes, if you're speaking to the Kiwanis and they're all over 80 and they're starting to nod off, uh, shorten it up. <laughs> That's happened, of course. 
Um, this is my fa favorite phrase in uh, death by PowerPoint. Um, we've all been part of this where somebody has their um, PowerPoint and it's filled with text and they read every word in the text. And, and we probably all fall in, into that trap ourselves on occasion and so we need to be aware of it. In fact, if I'm ever reading something, and I'm just going to jump. Just, just. I'm going to just jump in here and say, "Ha, huh, we we kind of did that today." But please, okay. excuse <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, and 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 actually, we should follow our own rules sometimes. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, and and you know, use images and graphics. And and so I felt a. I felt a strong need to include a, gra a graphic really quickly in this, um, <laughs> and um, and don't type every single thing you're going to say. Um, it, it's meant to be kind of the the base script, and then you improvise over the top of that. Um, going off script is something you can do. Be careful with that. But if you do see that there's an opportunity where someone's in the room that you can connect with, and you can talk about a story that involves them, you suck somebody else into your process and made it a more um, personal type of um, interaction. And last of all, be yourself. You're interesting and an expert in your own right. You do not have to be something you are not during these sorts of presentations. So um, it's, it is important to practice, as I said, time your speech by reading it aloud. Have it written out if you can um, at first, and then go through it so that you don't need to read it um, if, you can, if you can avoid reading it. Time it. Um, slow yourself down if you can, um, because when you get nervous, it's easy to go too fast. Um, reduce and simplify your language. Uh, get honest feedback so that you are so that you do your presentation to to someone who can give you honest feedback. Um, finalize it and it, transfer it to note cards for prompts. That's the preferred so that you're not reading it. But if you have to read it because it's really really important for you to say just the right exact thing, and sometimes that's just the way it is. Uh, at least print it in large font so that you can read it more easily and look up occasionally um, at the audience. Really important to uh, look up occasionally and connect with them. So how to handle questions um, at a presentation. Uh, listen and empathize. Uh, don't be defensive. Uh, try, try to find out what's behind the question, um, just like you're doing a reference interview. Um, don't repeat negatives. Uh, reframe the question so that you can make sure that you understand it. Be positive. Be honest and straightforward. That genuine authenticity will come across. And then admit it if you don't know it. Yes, and in many of these, I mean, you're in a sense you're selling yourself as a as an authentic and trustworthy person, and so sometimes it's it's almost the the content of what you're saying may may end up being less important than how you present yourself, and so you're trying to engender that that confidence. So yes, be honest, be positive, because that's what people want to see as somebody they would like to work with. <laughs> And then media relations is is a, a piece that may come into play. Um, sometimes it doesn't, depending on your library, but sometimes it does. And sometimes it will surprise you uh, when you weren't expecting a call from the media, depending on if something negative happens in your library. Um, so be prepared for it. Um, be, build relationships with managers and reporters if you can, if you have them. Um, I know that we don't necessarily all have them in every community within the state. But if something negative were to happen in your community, uh, those uh, media people will find their way to your library door. So it always helps to be proactive and build those relationships in advance. Um, if something negative happens, um, that's the most likely time that they'll call you. So take their phone call. Do not duck them. Um, do not run away from them. But be, but take but maybe take their phone call after you've had time to think about it. One of the things that I've learned is it's okay to say, I you know, can I have a little bit of time to think about this and call you back um, when you have a difficult thing that you need to respond to. Um, whether it's an angry patron or whether it's someone in the media, uh, it's okay to take a little time to think about it so you can have a thoughtful response. Respect their deadlines, though. They may have a, a press may have a deadline, and they and you know if their deadline is noon and you call at five two, you're clearly not being very respectful of their deadline. 
um, give them interviews as they request, not just when you want something, um, because if you just wait for when you want something, they're not going to answer your phone call either. So it is, a, it's a relationship, it's a two-way street. Uh, don't ever assume anything you say is off the record. Never assume that. Always assume it's on the record. So be careful what you say. Anticipate those questions, especially those really hard ones. Maybe they won't ask them, um, but if they do, you don't want to be caught flat-footed. You want to practice answers to those questions. Um, so really think about it. That's why I said taking that phone, taking that time to think before you have that phone conversation is really important. So it allows you that to be able to practice those answers. Uh, if you are having a press interview, these are just really important to know that you should never repeat a negative. Uh, sometimes reporters will take things out of context and they can get a sound bite by splicing what you said uh, to the negative piece. So don't repeat that negative. Don't give them that opportunity. Um, don't give a one-word answer uh, because it seems like you're avoiding answering the question. Um, but, uh, but then don't over-answer because don't ever say more than you need to so say because you can, you can get pulled into the weeds when you do that. Um, talk in sound bites. Uh, again, that's keeping that message short, uh, very succinct so that you aren't drifting off into the weeds and you're not allowing them ways to um, ask more difficult questions. Bridge, flag, and hook, and I do have a link here to a really uh, excellent article about um, what that means. So you'll see politicians do this a lot or professional media people, they bridge. So they don't really want to answer your question, right? So they they say something to acknowledge the question you asked. Maybe it's just, yes, I hear what you're saying, and then they bridge to something else. So this is what they really want to talk about. So you'll see that. That's a technique um, that politicians and um, PR people use a lot. They, they, they basically try to answer as little as possible and then bridge to what they want to talk about. You have to be careful with that because savvy people will understand exactly what it is you're doing, and you don't want to appear... Um, dishonest or inauthentic, so be careful. But um, the flag and the hook are just other techniques that you can use um, what, during uh, a press interview. And then there's the other uh, opportunity to go to an event that, uh, that someone will be at, whether it's a legislator or whether it's a city council person or a university um, um, administrator or, or whoever it is that you um, want to connect with, you can go to an event and then schmooze uh, with them so that you're building that relationship. So be aware of your presence, smile, extend your hand, introduce yourself, listen and respond, leave a card, take their card, and then take their card so that you have their contact information. And, and don't hesitate to send a thank you note. A handwritten note is best because it's more noticed than an email, but you may not have time to write a note, so feel free to at least send them an email thank you because um, it's a very nice thing to do after you meet someone. So summarizing advocacy, uh, really all politics are local, so relate it to the local issues. Ongoing relationships are best. Um, be respectful of their interests and their time and appreciative of any support or time that you get. Be informative, make it easy for them. Um, remember that face-to-face -face is best, be strategic and opportunistic. Remember, libraries are nonpartisan, so think about it in terms of your professional life. How you think personally is how you think personally, and that's fine. But when you're thinking about libraries, really, it is nonpartisan. We want people on all sides of every issue to love libraries as a neutral space. So remember that. Um, and if you're talking with a politician who's a partisan politician, just remember that you they're the incumbent. If they're the, if they're the person who's in that seat, they're the party of the incumbency. So we are nonpartisan and we will do our best to work um, have positive relationships with all people who are elected officials, and then be joyful about the library. Um, we have a very positive story to tell, and be it, it helps if you're you're happy and you're enthusiastic and you care passionately about the library. Yep, and I think that's one of the most powerful things I'd probably take away from this is that is that you you be passionate about about what you do. I mean, and and you have that passion. Make sure that fills your advocacy efforts because that's contagious, and people will be moved by that. So don't be afraid to express that enthusiasm. So, all right. So. 
we've talked a little bit about Wisconsin Library Association and how important that is and we have an upcoming opportunity at Library Legislative Day um, so uh, here's the uh, link for how to sign up for Legislative Day so I highly recommend that you attend Legislative Day there's a briefing ses session in the morning where we talk about what our message is so this uh, who should I talk to? Sign, you can sign up for your own legislators. They like to hear from their constituents the most if you live in their area. So I recommend you sign up for the people who represent you as a person with your home address if possible. But if not, your work address is, is okay too. You just say where you know what your interest is in, in their district. Um, and um, what should you say? Well, the you stay on message, uh, tell your story. Your own specific story is very powerful. They want to know what's happening in their district. So your story is really, really important at that time. Um, think about the call to action. What is it that you're asking for? We'll talk about that at the, in the morning in the brief, of the briefing session of uh, Legislative Day is what is the call to action? What are we asking for? And then how do we follow up? We send a thank you. Um, we pay attention to legislation as it follows its way, um, funding as it follows its way, whether it's at a state level or on your or your own local level. You need to stay engaged so that you can follow up every step of the way. Um, and then, of course, it's scary. It is scary, especially the first time you do it. So, um, if you a really good way to feel less scared is to sign up for Library Legislative Day because the the association makes it very easy for you. They make the appointments. You go with generally you go with a group, so you don't even have to say anything. You can just go observe um, and learn, uh, especially that first year, um, um, how how it is that these sessions happen. Um, and then yep, that and I, confidence for the next time. Yep, and Connie, I'd just add to that. Um, these legislators really love to hear from us. They are excited to talk to the librarians. They are. I think we are one of the most welcomed groups um, at the Capitol because, first of all, we're really nice, and second of all, we do our we do our research in advance, so we know what we're talking about, and and so they they love to have us there, and they and and the ones all of them I I've talked to believe firmly in what we do, and so know that you will have a, a welcome reception if you do this. So the tips for everyday advocacy are not much different. Um, it's, it's doing everything that we sort of talked about here today, being mindful um, of uh, what you say, your message, uh, the call to action, um, and um, not being afraid to, uh, to make that call. Um, the, there's power in numbers. There's in, in a united voice is incredibly powerful. So um, that's how you do it. Is you we all work together. I, I realize that we're out of time here, but if anyone has any questions, we'd be happy to try to answer them. All right, well, not hearing any questions. Thank you, Connie and Scott, so much for your time today. We really, really appreciate it. Um, if Thank you do have questions, you can send them to me. I sent all the emails about this webinar, so if you want to reply to one of those, I'd be happy to re relay questions um, along to Connie or Scott. Uh, so please feel free to do that. Again, thank you both for presenting today. It's really, I learned a ton and uh, we really appreciate your time and your work. And thank, thank you, you so much. And thanks everybody for, for attending. Yeah, thanks for attending thanks and for thank coming. you, Andy. Thank you, bye.